Hello, everyone. Welcome to a GeekCast. <laughs> uh, a very special edition uh, of a GeekCast. Um, uh, with me today, I have uh, Darren White uh, to my immediate left, and to his bottom is uh, Mindy Green. Uh, and to immediate, Mindy's immediate right is the Darren Martin hybrid that we have created and are currently working on. Um, so, uh, just to let you know, it's not clickbait. Um, it is there. And uh, <clears throat> that's coming 2030, 2045, depending on uh, how long we get to develop resources for it. Um, so uh, today, uh, there's a couple of things we want to bring up um, before we get to the meat of things, which is uh, basically um, uh, how to automate setting up contacts for remote access into the WCC2 uh, screen connect access through WCC2, the lab tech uh, contact access. Um, and uh, we're going to show you a lockout monitor that will do a lot of things revolving around that, um, emailing the client, letting them know they're locked out, and being able to do a whole bunch of stuff revolving around that. Um, so uh, I hope it's not echoing for anyone. Um, anyway, uh, back, back on topic. So a couple of things uh, we want to cover. Um, first and foremost, uh, I hope everyone is doing uh, well and okay. I hope everyone and their families are safe. Um, it is uh, very troubled times we are currently in. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I hope everyone's taking the precautions they need to. Um, I uh, haven't left my house in two weeks, um, but I work from home, so it's not normal. It's normal. It's the normal for me. Um, but uh, so uh, I hope everyone's adjusting, and uh, I hope everyone's doing, you know, well and. Uh, you know, so uh, there's a couple of things. There is a uh, plural site is a training website. They are doing a free April event. So um, let me get the link for everyone. I'll post it into the GeekCast channel and into uh, uh, copy. And I'll post it into here as well. Um, it's a free month of April. You can do some training, some learning. So uh, for those uh, very rare downtimes you may or may not have, um, you can probably spend some time uh, educating yourself for free uh, for Pluralsight. They're a pretty good website. I've used them in the past. Um, their videos are pretty good and their training is pretty good. So um, uh, without further ado, uh, we'll start with Mindy, who uh, began this um, uh, event chain um a while back so uh mindy uh what are you gonna do for us today um so connectwise automate has a functionality built in to allow their users or to allow msp's customers users to be able to remote into their computer uh so that way they can work from home remotely um as if they're in the office now this is obviously a feature everyone here knows about like vpns or remote desktop um, people often give out screen connect access, but the thing with ConnectWise Automate is that it's, I mean, it's all built into the same platform and functionality and software that everyone uses day to day. It also syncs the contacts from Manage if you have that or Autotask or wherever you're doing from. So it makes it all easily manageable or at least it's supposed to. That's the idea. Um, the thing is, and we actually ourselves at Intellicomp, we use this all the time, even before COVID-19 hit. We used to give, when we were on Continuum, we gave our clients access to log me in through their own accounts. Um, when we switched to Enable shortly, we did the same thing. And on LabTech, also, we did the same thing. Automate, sorry. We do the same thing. So one of the things that initially happened, and I'll just go through a quick history here. Um, there was two websites. There was one website, sorry. Uh, when I came on to start using LabTech a few years ago, uh, there was WCC2, which is the Web Control Center version 2. There was a legacy web control center, but I've never seen it. I don't know where it is or how to get to it. I don't even know if it still exists. Um, and I don't really care about it. But the WCC2 page looks like this uh, out of the box. And to log in, technicians would use their lab tech username and then password, and clients would use their email address and a password that we defined. So the question is, number one, um, how do we set up those contacts? Now, one other thing I forgot to mention was that uh, late, re, uh, recently, a few versions ago, LabTech actually split off the technician console to a newer portal, leaving WCC2 behind to the 
for a contacts to log in with. And the technician login is actually uh, the new Automate portal, which I called Automate Web App, um, although the name never stuck. Um, and that's where technicians log into now with using your lab tech username here. Um, contacts, actually, I can't, there you go. Contacts login over here using the older portal. So in order to create a contact login, you have to go through a few steps. Um, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, right now, we'll just go to Kyle's Backyard as our site. I'm going to create a contact over here. And this is, I'm in the standard browse screen where I can see computers, network devices, or retired assets. I'm just going to add a new contact. And I'll add Darren to it. And we'll do the email address. will be Darren at mspgeek.com. And we can set a web password here and then create it. Now, essentially, that's all you need to create a person's login. Though I have to remember what password I set because I, I don't remember the password that I set. Oh, it was a long time ago. We understand. <laughs> it was a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Way to go, Let's man. try this again. All right. Hold on. Let's try this again. Am I too quick? There it goes. OK, log in. All right, so now I'm inside the client dashboard. And officially, they should be able to see tickets that are created through LabTech, um, which includes like monitoring tickets and stuff like that that are assigned to their computers. But there's no computers or anything associated to it. Um, so the thing we have to do now is add a computer to, we can see here, assigned devices are none. In order to add a computer, you have to go through a specific step. You can't just open the contact and then go to computers. You can't, you can't do anything over here. Um, you can, there's two ways you can do it. You can either open a computer and associate the computer as that person. Uh, I believe it's up here under show details. Um, or, while well, we wait for that to load, here, under show details, I believe you can assign a contact to it, and that associates the computer to them. Or um, the other step is if you go into the client. Now, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to click on the client over here. It's just going to pop it open. Although, when I mean the client, really, you go to on the main tree, just double click on the client over here, and it opens it up. Um, under the contacts tab, you choose the client, the contact you want, and then you can associate the computers you want to give them. Okay, so that's step number two you have to take. There's no save button over here, and it's immediately associated to them. So I'm going to close it out, and I'm going to refresh the screen, and now I have three computers associated to it. Now there's a final step that you have to do. And again, it's not done inside the area we just were. <clears throat> so if I try going into the computer, I can see information, but I can't remote control. The final step we have to do is we have to assign permissions to the contact um, for remote access. And this is, again, it's a very lengthy process for doing a single contact. But if I come here under the permissions tab and I choose remote access and save, now I'm granting remote access to that user. And if I were to close, refresh, I may have to log out, I don't remember, but it, um, I should have the remote, no, I have the remote access button. So this is a three-step process you would have to do normally to set up a single contact at your customer. That's a long, um, arduous process. Yes, <clears throat> yes it is. So <laughs> when COVID-19 hit, uh, you know, everyone's freaking out, work from home, work from home. We came up with a rapid fire response essentially where we told our customers that we give you free remote access to your computer already. We can set it up for you at no cost. However, you have to do some work for us. We require them to give us a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet has to contain the, your first, the persons, the people who you want to have access. We need them to have their first name, their last name, their email address, and then the computer name that they want access to. Um, we can provide them. The most common question we got back was, how do we find their computer name, or how do I know what computer it is to, you know, to give them? Um, the fastest way we found to give them the report of their users is you can, I mean, there's many ways you can do it. Uh, my favorite way is to go just quickly build an advanced search. Um, so I'll just show you what that looks like. If you come here, you just quickly build a search. We're going to choose client name. And I like to do contains because I don't always know the full spelling of the client or get it correctly the first time. So I just, I'm just going to look for MSP and I get all the computers. And then I'm just going to grab... I have their current user, and I also want to grab the last logged on user in case someone's not logged in right now. So I believe it's under 
uh, OS, last username. And the way advanced search works is that you have to provide a value in order to get some kind of data in here. So I'm just going to do does not equal and then one, because there is never you're going to be a username that equals one. And here we have basically the last logged on user for where no one's logged in, and we have a current user for where there was no last logged on user, although I think it's a Linux thing. And then that's it. You just export all to Excel and you give it to the customer and say, here's a list of your computers and their users. You give us back a spreadsheet of the first name, last name, email address, and the computer that you want. And that's and we take that spreadsheet and run a script with it. So the script that I built, um, basically, here's an example of the CSV that we would take from the spreadsheet. And it includes, like I'm, I'm saying, first name, last name, the email address, and the computers. The computers is actually a colon separated value because you can assign multiple computers to contacts. Um, so, because if we have a user who needs access to multiple machines, we obviously don't want it to not have that automated. Um, and, and we take that script and uh, the script that I have imported is called, uh, I don't think, actually, that was the wrong window. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> I have to have at least one or two mistakes on the MSP Geekcast, right? <laughs> hey, it's, I mean, we, it's either audio issues or, you know, some kind of issues occurs. It's It wouldn't be a Geekcast without it. Now, this script is actually very ugly. So I don't want anyone looking at what the actual code is doing. But essentially, here's my notes. I put the CSV, must go on the LTShare drive. Um, we don't want it to go into the actual, like, transfer uploads or anything like hey, the maybe. system wants. Uh, yes. Uh, there's something you didn't preface, preface this before you started. This is currently on premise only. Um, yes, you're right. So there, there's script. Well, I'm getting to that. One of the things that the CSV file, the way the CSV file is processed is by executing PowerShell on the automate server. Um, that's how the CSV file is read and parsed. So, yes, this script will only work on-prem. It will not work for hosted. But we do have a surprise coming that I will uh, tell you more about at the end, it's which fine. will... I just uh, wanted to go ahead and say that because, you know... It, it's yeah, it'll, it'll fix the issue for hosted. Hosted people will be able to use this in the end. But there's a surprise coming. We'll just hang just on for that. Yeah, okay. So here's the script. Um, basically, I'm just going to run debug on it, and we will fill out. I'm going to run it against the client MSP Geek. I don't know why I have two clients. MSP Geek, now I'm confused. How is that? <laughs> How the heck? Uh, well, in any case, <clears throat> I'm just going to run it on that. And then we're going to um, grab the location of the contacts, and we're going to stick it in the LTShare path. And I'm referencing LTShare to just to make sure that it's actually going to that location, just because we have to account for not everyone knowing how to use it. So we've I've included that as part of the instructions that are required. I feel like my clipboard is syncing with someone who's connected because I just, there we go. The location ID I want to specify for me is three. Um, now, if you don't know the location ID, I hope everyone knows this, but the location ID is specified in parentheses after the actual location. And there is a difference between client and location. So don't put a client ID in there because it's going to come out badly. Um, the clock contacts are going to go to the wrong location and whatever. You can see here, Kyle's backyard location is a three. If you do not see that number under preferences, you want to make sure you have show IDs as opposed to hide IDs. By default, if they're hidden, you want to show them. Okay. Uh, so we have the ID, we have the script ready to go. I'm going to start. You don't have to debug the script. I'm debugging it so that way you can, I can show you what the script was at the same time. And I'm just going to finish it. And what's going to happen is that uh, it's going to grab that CSV. It's going to parse it with PowerShell and execute SQL. And we can see if I pull up SQL right now um, and just do select star from contacts where location ID I have three more contacts that were added in based off the CSV um, right here. Mendy, Kyle, and Michael. Don't ask why some last names are there and some of them are made up. Um, so I can close out this window. 
And if I go back to refresh the screen, we will see that the contacts were created. Now we've done this successfully in production for our customers for over 40 contacts simultaneously. And this is something that saves you a significant amount of time. You can see that the devices are already assigned based off we know the, co the colon separated values that were on here. Okay, so Mendy has three computers associated. Mendy-10 Pro, GLT File 16, GLT VM Host. All right, Michael has two, a Linux computer, a uh, Pi-hole, and a Mendy-10 Pro, right? This works for Mac computers as well, which have, um, they have apostrophes in their names because they have the user apostrophe S, iMac, or MacBook Pro, or whatever stupid name they come up with. So even if you have a uh, Mac or something like that, the name works fine, the computers get associated. And the final thing is, is that the permissions get set. Uh, hold on. That's Darren's. The permissions. You had Darren's username up. Okay. <laughs> Good catch, Kyle. <laughs> I was like panicky for a second. I'm like, oh no. The remote access permission gets set automatically for the contacts as well. So it's really just a matter of taking a spreadsheet from the customer, spending a minute and a half building, replacing it into a CSV, and then running the script, and your contacts get created, and that's it. The final step here is we have to set passwords for the user. Now, that can be done, as I displayed, uh, manually under the web password. Or um, what we prefer to do is send out password reset emails. And all you have to do is right-click on the client and just send a web password email. And that's it. It'll send out a web password email automatically to every contact under that client. Um, when you get this prompt, you want to click yes. Going back to what I was telling you, WCC2 versus a legacy portal, this message has been here since like 10.5, and it's always referring to the legacy prior to Automate Web App. So don't ever click no. You always want to click yes for this. So we okay? have a question. Um... So for those of you who don't know, uh, Screen Connect is included with your agent count for Automate. So if you have 100 licenses for, for Automate agents, you have 100 Screen Connect session licenses for that. Uh, right. So is that, is that Andre's question you're asking about? Like, how are you covering the cost of the licenses? Yes. So it's included. That Right. We don't pay extra for our clients accessing the Screen Connect because we're not using a different Screen Connect server. It's using the Screen Connect server from LabTech. The LabTech licenses covers the access sessions, and you can have un unlimited number of hosts connecting to those access sessions. Um, when you get when you're licensed, let's say for 100 agents on LabTech, you have 100 Screen Connect licenses you can install. If you go to more than that, only the first hundred will check in. Uh, that happens to check in at a time. Anything extra. The Screen Connect will install, but when it checks in, it won't actually build a session that you can connect to. Um, you're not licensed per technician or per user accessing. You're licensed per machine connecting back to your server for that situation. So that's why it doesn't cost us anything. You it know, also for doesn't the, cost you know. our client anything, and you know, because everyone's all about you know saving money right now because of you know uh, just the, the the quarantine and everyone has to stay at home and everything is you know slowing down. So uh, utilizing this uh, already included software package is um, it, it, it it's a win-win for everyone. Um, and we've had what 250 more simultaneous connections from our clients. And yeah, we've hit almost 300 the other day. I think today we hit almost 300 simultaneously connected. I mean, our our customers are using it. And no performance um, issues. We've had we've had slight performance issues with Screen Connect where we've had to increase the number of processors, but our memory hit has not touched has not changed at all, um, and that's it. I mean, we've got feedback from customers telling us, you know, thank you for getting on it so quickly. We've turned this around in two three days for them, um, from since when they needed to start working remotely, and and they've all been very appreciative of the fact that we can turn it around so quickly, you know, without an additional cost. Yeah. Um, um. I mean, some some clients already have RGS gateways set up. Some already have VPNs set up, but not everyone is, uh, you know. The work from home mantra is is kind of a new thing where, uh, you know, most CEOs, most high level executives don't believe in a work from home type scenario. So, because of the quarantine, they've had to quickly adopt the work from home culture, 
and adapt, which is why Teams is exploding. Everyone wants Microsoft Teams for communication and collaboration. But Teams doesn't have all your files. It doesn't have all of your local stuff on your desktop. Um, so Screen Connect, through your own Automate server that you guys have, um, is honestly, it's, it's an amazing tool that we don't necessarily advertise to our clients unless we're in this type of situation right now because there, there's just some other stuff that you know it's not the perfect tool but it's the best that we have available that costs nothing but time to set up right so going back to that what when i first talked started talking about it i mentioned that this is our rapid response is what we made customers give us the spreadsheet they a lot some customers have come back and said listen we can't figure this out. We need you to build out the, the list of users and computer names. In which case, we said, okay, that's fine, but we're going to deprioritize your request. It's not going to be as important as people who give us that information because we can turn those around faster. Um, and then we just build them for the time if it takes longer than you know an hour or two to put the information together. Okay. And then we had other customers come back and said, we already have existing remote access we want to use or we want to expand, and we turn those as well into the lower priority requests that we would charge for to in order to set up additional users or you know depending on how much labor was involved so that way we can focus our attention specifically on giving this solution out which doesn't cost us anything doesn't cost them anything and we can literally turn up in five minutes um if so, they give us the spreadsheet neil uh yes mfa is coming to contact login um i don't think there's any current time they're pushing it as quickly as they can but i don't know um you know i don't think we have an official timeline of when that's coming but it is coming um we've we've been pushing that for a while and i think with us doing this and you know the COVID situation that they're pushing it much more rapidly than they had initially planned to so um it is coming i just don't have a date for when that is it's probably not going to be soon unfortunately but uh, it, it it is coming. We've heard that they are, they are planning to add it, and it did get uh, that jumped. So, but they 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 plan and design way ahead of time. So, it got pushed in, but just it's probably not coming. Uh, I think the rumor was like patch summer, summer, <laughs> hit, hit patch summer, six or seven, patch summer, um, yeah, something but, like uh, that. But yeah, we've addressed any, it with I them. Mean, and, and, and they understand and they're working on it. Um, they actually uh, were asking us about this, the, you know, the stuff we're doing to make sure that what they're doing is not going to hurt what we're already doing for our clients. So, um, Right. They actually, so that brings us to the next part, which is what Darren's here for. Because while I was working on this, Darren was started working on something else. Darren's concern was we don't have any auditing occurring. You know, when the user logs in. And I'm not going to go into his stuff because he can talk about it. He's on the call with us. So, Darren, why don't you explain your thoughts and uh, the process and how that works? All right. So, um, the Web Control Center does have a brute force lockout. Let me uh, re engage my input so that I can drive on that. All right. So, show you where this is configured. If you go to the dashboard, config and integration uh, for Web Control Center, uh, you can see that there is, there we go. There are some lockout settings that are available. So there are, after five failed login attempts, any contact that fails is going to be uh, locked out for this amount of time. And uh, there's an idle timeout. So what that looks like for the user, it's actually a security thing. It's a sign out. Is that, uh, nobody at nobody.com? Nobody at contact.com. Please don't try to email. All right. Actually, I'm going <laughs> to... Okay, so this is a completely invalid account. Doesn't exist at all. We get just this generic message, user password failed or access denied. So it does not tell you if your password is wrong, if the user isn't recognized, or if the account is locked out. If we pick an actual account and try, we get the same message. 
And let's do this five times. And then jump back here. Actually, I have to close and reopen it. Sorry to refresh that screen. Uh, what we should see now is that that account has become locked out. But you notice that, you know, from the end user perspective, there's nothing telling you that it's locked out. Uh, so at first, I was kind of worried that brute force protection stuff wasn't in place. I was happy to find out, oh, okay, they do have this built in. So you want to make sure that you do have this configured. Make sure you do have a failed login count set uh, with a reasonable number of login attempts and a reasonable uh, amount of time to lock out. Hey, I do believe uh, these are the default. While you're discussing this, uh, if for some reason you still have an admin account that's called admin, please remove that. It's, it, it was a former default account that's no longer in use, but some older installations may still have it. Uh, for the love of all MSPs, please remove that account. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that PSA. <laughs> all right. So this account is locked out, and I believe we can unlock it, right? Uh, everyone knows how to remove, right? Double click. You double click to remove. <laughs> <laughs> thank so, you, Greg. <laughs> uh, now now we've, we've cleared that locked out account. All right. So, but if we'd have waited 15 minutes, it would have gone by. Uh, that is it. That is the only thing that tells you that the account was ever locked out. There is no uh, log that's showing that the account locked out. Uh, there's no other notification that goes to the end user telling them that their account's been locked. So they may continue trying passwords, not knowing that they've been locked out. Uh, they're just going to get frustrated, you know, a lot of issues. So. Uh, I looked at making a change so that I would be able to uh, identify when an account is getting locked out uh, so that I can see if there is a pattern of attack or something that's going on uh, and also provide some value to the end user to be able to uh, notify them that their account has been locked out. So this is what I came up with. It's beautiful, as all Darren's the creations. It's abusive. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way, though. As all Darren's <laughs> creations. <laughs> I mean, to get to the point, though, aren't all monitors abusive? I guess so. All good ones. <laughs> Is it raw SQL monitor? All good ones, anyway. So, has this ran? All right, good. This, this uh, has ran. We see it last ran at 9.07, and in fact, it should be running right now. Do any minute, uh, any second. So that's going to run again. Let's take a look. If we are an admin and we go to the dashboard, and management and audit action. So there's actually an uh, an audit action for count lockout. Um, but I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> it's under failed logins, no? Is it? Is that what it is? A failed login? Yeah, I think so. Did I select an action? But I don't see anything here. Oh, oh. there we go. It just takes. There, hour. I was I was impatient, clicking too fast. <laughs> All right. I mean, that's all of us, though. I mean, to be fair, why are we wait all that to load again? Uh, but I mean, that's it. Should, it, it should be faster. Where's the uh, REST API? All right, ha hands off. I'm I'm gonna wait for this this to refresh. How do we know if it's done? It <laughs> should have actions listed. It it should pop up uh, all the results. Each time I clicked on it, it, it was April populating second. everything. Can you hit refresh? And now wait. Let's see what happens. Dun dun dun. <sighs> Hands off. Waiting, waiting. So just by the way, we are running his monitor in production, and it works perfectly fine. And I know Darren's using it, and it works for him too. So if it doesn't work here, it's because of my test environment. Well, to be fair, you are any other like reason. Four months, four months, two months worth of <laughs> records. There. I don't see it in here. 
we see the contacts created, but we don't see the lockout occur. Uh, I will also say that two minutes prior to me hitting the change button, uh, we were installing this monitor, so and still configuring things. So it's it's. Well, that will be uh, disappointing to not see it here. So, um, yeah, that's just what, what else? Uh, well, let's take a look at the monitor, show you what let's it should be doing. And we've got YOG. So, yeah, let's let's throw the monitor into YOG real quick and just see if it's spitting out any errors. Uh, so right now, this monitor has been tested on four systems. <laughs> or so it, it is not oh, look there it is it's yeah. showing that it was that's locked out but it's not it's not um Auditing. it didn't log in the audit it's just not going into the audit log for some reason watch us live uh, as we debug monitors yeah and automate uh, <laughs> let's grab the sequel did i make a mistake somewhere that's probably the most likely. That is not what I. No, Control A did not grab everything. There you go. Okay. Uh, so this is what I like to call mon raw SQL monitor abuse uh, because <laughs> this monitor, instead of running a simple query, it's doing a bunch of things. So uh, uh, I will preface this by saying, uh, please do not do this to your system unless you absolutely, unless you have Darren's caliber and skill. Please continue. Uh, even even then, it's probably not advised. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so this monitor is going to uh, first step here. We are selecting records uh, where the contact ID is inside this temporary table and where's the criteria where 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 oh that's that's all being built up here uh so this is grabbing all contacts uh where the uh login fail count is negative one that's what happens in the database when an account is locked out and where the lock lock login lock time is greater than now so the account is currently locked out so each time this runs, it's going to look for uh, any contact that is freshly locked out. This other join here to the database alerts is going to exclude any user that we've already notified for. Uh, so each time an account is locked out, this is going to gain a record. First thing it's going to do is shoot out an email uh, to this person telling them that their remote control account has been locked out. Uh, it's going to fill in their name, their email address, uh, the URL for the server address that they should be going to, uh, all that kind of information. Uh, so the value there is that the user should be notified within you know, about <laughs> minutes, maybe, that their account has been locked out. So they know, okay, stop trying to enter the password uh, repeatedly. They know how long they need to wait until they can try again. Uh, the next thing it does here is just entering a record into the database alerts table. Uh, this is where I'm marking that we have notified this person. Uh, this is the step where it seems that we, we had off. Um, it is trying to find a failed login audit action. So I have that. I'm wondering if do, oh, the system is right there. Or are you just going to find it on the list? should just be in this list, right? Yeah, under F, it's not uh, It's not there. G, yeah, you don't have a failed login. That's so well, weird. There's there's the problem. Um, cool. <laughs> so Mindy hasn't updated his system probably since like 2013. So the current 2020.1 requires that you have working functional email on your system so that you can install it because it emails out an MFA code. Um, and if you Maybe don't have the functional email, login comes in. <laughs> so, there, so I have not updated the 2020.1 because I do not have working email. So we were hoping to show you the audit entry so that way we can prove to you that, that it works and how well it works because I'm not going to show you email. But unfortunately, apparently, uh, it doesn't work. Why wouldn't it's it okay. Darren fixes it. Uh, I was about to say, yes. 
now now when you try to update to 2020.1 sql query is going to fail when it well, tries to add that in we should that's funny we should <laughs> see um we should see the database alert there right if you check the database alert we should see the mention of the fail login uh yeah if we look at the database alert so um we should have actually seen an entry for each uh, so there should actually be a result in here for each time it locked out three or is that I, oh, three I wonder, is the contact id yeah i wonder if this monitor hadn't been running each time we'd previously locked it out. Uh, anyways, we'll uh, we'll ignore that for right now. Um, but let's go lock it out again and see if it shows up the way that it should. We know that we are currently not locked, so we just need five failed logins. And then go back. All right. Let's give that a minute to run. So it should be inserting a record in the audit log. Uh, so this gives the administrator you know, the ability to go back and see, uh, according to whatever your retention policy is for the audit log, that users have been locked out. Uh, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, so this last setting I've got here, uh, lockouts permitted. This is how many times an account can be locked out before the monitor will return. So all these queries are running each time the monitor runs, but the output of this last query is what actually gets reported in the monitor as a failure. Uh, so if the monitor action uh, was set to generate a ticket, then uh, the all of this stuff returning a result is what would actually generate a ticket. So we don't want to generate a ticket or do something every time an account gets locked out, right? We've already recorded it in the audit log. We've already shot an email. So uh, this will only fire or alert if we have exceeded this count. So we have to have locked out at least four times before. Uh, for this monitor to return an error. Uh, so at that point, it would generate a ticket that uh, you as an administrator could you know, look into and say, okay, uh, I've got a user who's obviously got a pattern of lockouts. So maybe they need a little help. You know, They haven't raised their hand yet, but maybe they need some help getting their password reset, or maybe they uh, are under attack and they're not notifying us. You know, So we need to do something, You know, disable their account, et cetera. Uh, so it's more than three lockouts within what period of time? One day, two days. So because we're using the database alerts here, uh, whatever this duplicate alert frequency is set to is the interval that we're going to be monitoring for. So if I set this to once per seven days, then it's going to create a ticket if there's more than three lockouts in seven days. If I have this just at, you know, once per two days, more than three lockouts within two days. Uh, so those are the knobs. You know, those are the only things that you would need to uh, mess with with this monitor, changing the monitor mode and changing the number of lockouts permitted. Let's see. Let's check the audit log. Let's see if it showed up now. Close without saving. Let's see that it's actually ran. I love my alt tab. Where is that? Right. There it is. Yeah, it ran a minute ago. Been running. Uh, because Mindy kind of has the system isolated off, he does not have email alerts working. Not that nobody at contact.com is going to tell us <laughs> got the alert. Um, but we're not going to be able to demonstrate that at this moment. And let's look here. You may have to close that and reopen the entire, yeah, or do that. That should work. 
There you go. There's, there's one failed log right log yeah, I've failed login. Uh, it should All be users. Showing. It should be showing. I don't trust this. What is <laughs> How disappointing. It should definitely uh, be showing up. Let's look at that monitor history and see uh, what it's showing. Uh, what am I looking for? I need to open this. Now there's two of them. So that part's working, right? Because okay. there, there should be a record for every lockout, right? Yep. Uh, so we need to get this to four lockouts to be able to actually trigger, trigger the alert. So at this point, you see that the history is not showing any alert. This has not officially triggered an alert yet. It would not have created a ticket or anything. Um, I really wish that audit entry was showing up. Uh, that would make me happier. All right, I'm going to lock it out again. We'll run the SQL query and see what error happens. We'll ignore the monitor uh, so we can get through this quickly. And then move on to the uh, Q&A or whatever next part. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for. You want to lock it out again for the browser? I want to unlock it. Oh, right. I should get rid of this Veeam plugin, which doesn't work anyways. Yeah, it wants a license. I know. <laughs> you don't have to wait for it. You can just click. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I know you had to wait for that. All right. So let's double click to remove. Okay. We are unlocked. Uh, let's get to Yog just to focus, or, uh, bring the query over. Just so everyone understands how this is working, we're not, Darren's not running a script to send an email out to the end user. He's abusing the database to send an email by dumping the email directly into the database. If you want to change what the email says, you have to change it inside the monitor. You have to edit the SQL inside the monitor to edit what you want. The right. He's just, he's dumping it into the database that the, the table that the automate system uses to send emails out normally. And expecting the general, you know, the 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 default, the ran, the the built-in engine that sends out emails to pick it up out of the database and send the email like it like it should do it. So there's no like additional scripts or anything required. It doesn't take up any time or any uh, script processing power or whatever it is that's on there from the script engine. It's just every time the monitor runs and finds it, it's dumping the email into the database. And the next time the database the engine runs, the database agent is sending out the email. It'll pick it up and send it out. Okay, good. All right, and so I've got it. So it's going to actually show the output of each each step as it runs, so we can kind of see what it would look like uh, if it's returning results and if we get any errors. Okay, good. All right, all set up. Let's go lock it out. Uh, again, this is definitely database abuse. So. Uh, Please do not create anything like this unless you know what they are, or unless you know what you're doing and are willing to completely destroy your database. Did you do it five times? Did I not? Uh, Was that five it. times? I don't know. Do I need one more fail? Is that refresh on switching tabs? It must not, because that account's got to be locked out now. Yeah. All right, let's just go to the SQL and see what we get. Oh. And, uh, well, that threw an error because I just reloaded the one. Oh. Uh, not finding any of these people. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what you get prior running in production prior to testing before going <laughs> live. Um, it's normal, happens to everyone. Uh, as Darren is mentally processing how to fix it, uh, I will continue to fill the dead air. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but you know, you, raw SQL monitors are fantastic. Um, you can't abuse your system. Um, oh, look, there he goes. He's got data. Is that bad data or good data? There's no other. Where's the rest of it? I'm looking. All right. So. It did not generate the email. It did not generate the audit action. So I'm going to guess that some of these things, like um, in the email, it is looking for an email address, first name, last name, your account has been locked out. Um, it could very well be the version difference as well, because. I wonder, uh, yeah, what, I have 20, to verify all these. Dot things four got released today, right? <laughs> is that the email I got? Was that was that? I think that was a mistaken release, or was that a? <laughs> Darren, do you need a reboot? Uh, Martin would like to know. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, Can we query your uptime? Uh, I'm all right. Um, <clears throat> it didn't throw an error. I would uh, if it threw an error, then uh, it would. Be a little more clear. It. So, <laughs> right. I, I mean, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna have to I investigate this offline, and this is why this monitor is not released <laughs> yet. So, uh, but you know, like we said, this is a little little sneak peek of some stuff that uh, we're working on to help the community out because uh, this is a good solution. Um, I think we have posted some of the information on how to set this up for your contacts. Uh, being able to set it up for multiple contacts at once is, is great, but even as a one-off, uh, it's a great thing to know that the product offers. It's a great thing to be able to have. And then to know that if somebody does get locked out, that they're going to be able to get an email that tells them, you know, hey, your account's been locked out. Uh, that's good. And to be able to, you know, have a record of how many times have accounts been locked out over the last, you know, day or week or you know, something. Uh, auditing is very important. So uh, this will kind of fill those gaps in. Uh, and my goal, of course, is to make make everything as backwards compatible and flexible as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I can tell you, we, we run, like I said, we run this monitor in, in production in the last few days since we've been running it. I, I check our auto logs and I laugh at the users that get locked out because it's funny to me. Um, uh, oh, th thanks for displaying my key. That That's great. It doesn't work anyway. I thought they killed it. <laughs> just, just hit the close button over there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, there is a question. In any case. Um, there is yeah, database access. Screen Connect data. Are you referring to like, uh, there's a database for Screen Connect. It's in SQLite, which is a great database so if you're under like 10 agents. Um, but uh, if you're referring to like information inside of Automate, uh, there is information. It's just not up to date. So, yeah. uh, for example, if you look at plugin screen connect, you can see uh, there's connection audits, right? And you should be able to see a user who's been connecting. So right now, you can see um, who connected to this computer, what their network address was, what time, what the duration was, and so on and so forth. Um, now, this is not real time data. This data is about one day behind. Um, and uh, you can Grafana off. So I built a Grafana dashboard off this specifically for our customers, and we give out for people who want to know, like, hey, our, how do we know our users are actually working? They get a 24-hour delay on the data, um, but because Grafana is tied to Automate, it's easy, it was easy to build, and they can filter for a user or you know, for their computer in order to see who connected and how long they were connected for. Um, as a couple of things, uh, Grafana was going to be this uh, Geekcast, <laughs> but uh, as you can see, we've, we've altered that. Well, that'll be the next one we plan and do. Um, and just in case anyone's curious, uh, the key that Mindy showed is tied to his IP address, so you'd have to have that cleared off before you could steal it. So moving on. <laughs> um, in any case, not to get too hung up on my key. Uh, the other thing was, yeah, C Screen Connect runs off SQLite. Um, it works off any database that you can configure the connection to, um, but it's not supported on anything other than SQLite. 
it happens to be that for ourselves at IntelliComp, we run our Screen Connect off uh, MSSQL. The better database. Um, so if I wanted to, I can get live data out of there and, and dashboard off of that, but I was lazy, so I didn't. Yeah, but there is a there is a SQL database. So if anyone has ever felt like diving into the email connector uh, and the log oh, file God. that it puts out is a... It's SQLite. It's a SQLite. <laughs> Uh, database file um, so you can just google SQLite database viewer like SQLite browser I think is the one that right is yeah SQLite browser so I mean and you can look at your database you can look at the data in there um, don't change anything you might corrupt your database and that would be really bad um, and uh, yeah I mean it's okay. So, all right. Uh, so, so let me jump back to something. I think we've uh, covered it. the SQLite database enough. Uh, just some fun things around contact management and computer management. Uh, so right now, let's see. Uh, I am assigned, and I'm just taking a look at which which computers we've got. Uh, so I saw Pi-hole on one person. Yeah, Michael. Yep. Are there any? Computers that aren't assigned to anybody. Uh, probably. Uh, Mindy dash PC. Mindy dash PC. There were no contacts so. that had it. Yeah, I think uh, so. So this this is just a fun little thing. Um, oh God. PC. Yeah. All right. Okay. I mean, so, there is there's probably there's probably is a contact on the other client that's, that so has it. One but. one thing that Mindy mentioned earlier is one way to assign remote access is by going to the computer, going to show details. When it loads. Uh, when it loads. <laughs> and selecting a contact. So let's... Uh, that's a little weird. Can you not? Uh, there you <laughs> <go>. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, select this. Con Wait, is that a global contact? Yeah, that's a system contact. System contact. OK. So now we got Kyle on here. Great, let's take a look back here and contacts. And Perfect. sure enough, Kyle is now on here. Uh, I made a mistake though. This is Mindy's computer. Mindy should have access. Mindy's who should the, co the contact should be. Oh my God, does it not remove it? Oh, come on, don't spoil the surprise. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> So here's oh where this God. gets really, really fun. All right, who do I who do I want? Is was it Mindy? No, it was Michael down arrow. No, it wasn't Michael. It was Darren. Yeah, that that's who the contact should be. Oh God! Now you've assigned to everyone. <laughs> yes. So uh, when you're selecting the contact, use the drop down, select it. Do not use the arrow keys to uh, <laughs> to select and and move move around. Hey, is there a so, ticket for this? Please tell me if you take it for this. Uh, yeah. In no. support? There's, there's, so just, just there's for some background. This. <laughs> this, this behavior is by design. Let me, uh, let me have control for a second, oh, Darren. Let God, me have control please. for a second. Go for it. That's so in, this, in the database, you'll see a, a table called contact computers. And you can see what it is, is it's literally just a list of contact IDs and computer IDs that map together. Now, this list is completely uh, agnostic. I don't know if that's the right term, but it doesn't care what client or location the computer is in or what client location the, the contact is in. If you move one from one to the other and it was previously assigned, it doesn't go away. Um, so it's just funny what Darren showed me because it makes so much sense by design for that to work because every time you click this button or a change occurs, you are committing to that database the contact ID of the contact and the computer ID of the computer. And there's no remove function for that. So this is <laughs> how that's happening. So, All right, sorry, uh, go on. I'm going to show, you know, show another place that kind of helps that. When you're looking at the client view here uh, and you select a contact, you can see which computers are associated to that. Um, so it makes complete sense that you know this person might be associated to a bunch of computers, right? Uh, <laughs> I can't double click to remove. <laughs> so, so you actually have to uh, remove right this one, right? Association, yeah. yeah. Um, 
So it, it would make sense that one person can be associated to multiple, and that's why that behavior happens. Uh, right. Even though you've changed the contact, that may not be the only person that has access to that computer. So it's just a fun thing to, to know about and uh, is an interesting thing when you're wondering about why one computer has like a dozen different contacts that are all able to access. It. That's why. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, so just to wrap up, I, Kyle mentioned earlier, my script doesn't work on hosted systems. And um, Darren's monitor works on all systems once it's actually in release uh, status. Um, it's not reliant on you having access to the to the actual automated server to run. We reached out to our wonderful friend admin Michael Priest, and um, he promised we've enlisted us. his help. He did not make any promises <laughs> with any deadline, but he has started a plugin that takes the functionality of what we just showed you and packages it into a nice DLL with a much easier to use interface than what I showed you on this uh, cast. Um, at the time of this uh, cast, it is uh, not done, um, and there's no ETA currently, um, but uh, we're hoping it's uh, soon, TM. Um, we hope it's before the MFA release for contacts. Um, <laughs> so. The other thing is is that included in the, in the plugin, I believe, um, and if I'm wrong, you can't come back to me and yell at me later, but I think from my discussions with Michael that the plugin is going to include uh, some functionality to customize the email that gets sent out uh, when a password reset is done and also to customize the email that Darren has uh, slammed into his SQL and uh, forced into the database for when a lockout occurs. Um, so we will have some nice user interface and easy to use uh, functionality for CSV importing and uh, lockout monitoring and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and I'm a hundred percent sure that Michael is listening so that if it, he said anything wrong, uh, that he would get, Mindy would get yelled at. So, um, oh, yeah. everyone should announce. Thank you, Michael, or thank yes. you at M priest. Make sure you tag him in the Slack team. Thank you at M priest. <laughs> Because uh, it's it's we free. want to flood him it's with a, alerts because it's, it's a free, free plugin. And... <laughs> um, it will not be charged. It will not have any microtransactions. Um, maybe we should really we, maybe we can get him to release skins for it for donations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. Maybe. Other than that. Um... I mean, so uh, there's actually a few things I found online when I was looking at to see, because like as an IT person, you know, a lot of the job kind of goes away as customers are no longer able to work properly, the priorities shift. Um, so you find yourself with more free time. And I found there's actually been this program that's been around for a while uh, to help, um, you know, cure diseases and stuff, where basically they essentially look for people to donate uh, GPU processing power. And you run their, it's called folding at home. Uh, you run their software on your computer if you have a GPU and it's like Bitcoin mining, except you're putting your powers to good use or you're solving uh, algorithms to help cure cancer or Alzheimer's or things like that. It's, it's folding at home. You should look it up. Uh, um, I, I've used it before. It's really nice. Um, they, the, the, the application you get that you install on your PC for folding at home, um, it will actually throttle itself. So if you use your GPO um, or GPO, GPU, uh, it will actually throttle down um, and let you use whatever you want to use it for, you know, gaming or video displaying or whatever. Um, so it is it is a great thing. It's been around for eons. Um, God, I mean, back. I mean, the, they were doing massive PlayStation Three, uh, those massive PlayStation Three supercomputers. They were just running straight fold at home um, against uh, trying to help with cancer research. Um, so it's it, it's a it's a great tool. It's a great thing. Um, and you know, anything you can do to to help out um, in this day and age, which is why we're here. Um, we we want to you know as we always do as Darren is editing his code. Um, 
we want you know we want to give back to the community we want to help the community you know we're all involved we're all together in this um, we're all msps um we you know it's important to us to you know make sure that all of you guys who are watching now who are watching in the future uh, who are part of our community are um, that we can help out as much as we are able to and as much as we can so um if you find a way to give back if you have any other ideas tips um anything that helps uh if you may be hiring for some reason and you you, you know you want to reach out to the community and maybe someone who can do some remote troubleshooting work is available um let us know you know the msp general channel is you know pretty good for that um so it's it if, if you know uh, of anything to help um if you have any tips any business tricks um so i know it's it's a it's a tough time for everybody even though those of us who are um if you have an admin account called admin, first of all, reset the password immediately. Uh, and I'd at the very it. least, if you don't if you don't feel comfortable removing it, at the very least, reset it. Um, I don't think there's a way to actually disable an account in LabTech, but I could be wrong. Um, you can effectively disable an account if you clear all the user classes. Um, it's not going to be able to log in. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. But uh, if you if you know of uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, that message is really funny. Sorry. Uh, if you know of any, you know, if you need any, uh, know of any uh, assistance or you know, hiring, if someone might need a job, you know, we we want to give back, we want to help out with the community. So if, if if you know of anybody or if you'd like to help out, um, you know, maybe host a geek class to teach something, you know, we'll I'll help throw you up on stream and let you talk for an hour 45 minutes um about whatever you want to talk about uh you know let's uh, we're here to get back to the community we want to get back to the community and um so uh and purchase do it how, the, are you not able to click okay what's the big deal how long has this been open <laughs> <laughs> that's why i was laughing earlier um so uh in perch and huntress are doing the v cybercon uh coming up soon um it's free it's digital uh feel free to check it out um there's an announcement post which should still be there uh it's uh it looks interesting it looks good i'll probably visit around if i have time um but uh we're here for you uh if you guys need anything um reach out uh if you have any ideas or any additional things that may be able to help uh help out you know maybe you have a specific deployment monitor or deployment system that you guys use um, and you want to share it with the community, let us know. We'll, we'll spotlight it. Um, we'll make sure Mindy runs it and it runs effectively on his system. I'll get email working and then I'll update, I guess. Could you... Oh, look. You got, an e you got an email? I don't know if I want to necessarily in. talk about this, but couldn't you just intercept the SMTP, what it was trying to broadcast, and then just take the code that the MFA code out of it. I mean, it's just an SMTP um, relay, I assume. Yeah, but the email fails to send because it has to connect out to something. I have to set up a mail server for it to receive it. But yeah, I mean, whatever. There's ways around. So, uh, as Michael has said in the uh, chat, uh, he has started this yesterday, and he he said it was going to be done by the time the geekcast started, but that's obviously not true. Um, and uh, My, Michael didn't say that. Michael <laughs> called me. We had a call 24 hours ago to discuss the initial discovery of what I was doing, so he could start building it. <laughs> and he's actually done a tremendous job coming this far with what he has already. Um, yeah, it, it looks great. It looks fantastic. And uh, the more screenshots he shows off, the more is added to it every single time he's working on it right now as he's listening to this horrible podcast um and us jibbering about nothing while darren codes his monitor on a machine that's obviously so far old that it's not going to work but i guess it's good for testing it to him. make it um yes he's on Do the we have any call. questions or is there any questions yeah i mean we're, we're here to if you guys have any questions um, you guys have any statements you want to make? Uh, let us uh, let us know. Um, and you know, we're here for you. Uh, ask, and I will answer, even if it's wrong. 
my philosophy. I'll give you an answer. Just ask Mindy. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a nice little chat about uh, migrating from SQLite to uh, MS SQL and Twitch. Mindy, if oh. you're curious. Oh, well, I'm not yeah. in Twitch, guys. So if you want to ask me any questions, you got to jump over to Slack. Um, yeah, just I'll be happy to over. give you the process on how to do it. Um, just be aware that support does not support it. So if they know about it, uh, they they won't necessarily like it. But also be aware that in the event you do have to switch back to SQLite, the only thing that gets lost is uh, historical data um, as that file just basically rebuilds and all your sessions check back in. It's not a big deal in terms of like if all hell breaks loose and you have to get support involved, then it's really not a big deal to switch back. Um, and then if you switch back again, then theoretically all your data comes back. So um, it wasn't a showstopper for us. We haven't called support for Screen Connect uh, since their licensing server went down like th three years ago. And it wasn't even our fault then, so we didn't have to do anything. <laughs> uh, I th uh, there will be a recording of this Twitch, although the first like five minutes of it wasn't recorded because I forgot to hit the button because it's been a while since I've done this, so don't yell at me. But uh, screen every time I talk to any any head honcho at uh, Automate, I tell them to leave Screen Connect alone because it's the best product they ever have. It's the most stable. It's the least issue that I've seen. Uh, Sean, I yeah. think it, I think the it, it's not an issue of uh, SMTP. It's more of Mindy doesn't have SMTP enabled on his development server, so we can't install the latest version um, of Automate. So we're running on like Automate 2012, 20, 20, 2013, somewhere in there. What? <laughs> uh, I think I might have uh, <clears throat> might have learned where this went wrong. Uh, the lockout settings it shows in the dashboard. Those are defaults, right? Yeah, that's correct. I'm not seeing anything in the table where I'm expecting those values to be. Oh. Uh, if you've never changed them, then it would maybe never get that recorded. table is in. Yeah. And I go in there and just change the lockout and then see if the values are there. Wow. So we've just run into the, uh, the EDF syndrome. Where everything's in EDF? Well, no, we're, the EDF has no value until you record something in there, even if there's a default value, I think. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So it's the same thing. Um, I can confirm Mindy is lazy. When Boom. he's solved the problem. So if if there is a problem that's unsolved, it's like a tick. He can't not do anything else until that problem solved. He may get distracted for like 10, 15 minutes, maybe a little longer than that, but immediately back to the task at hand. Um, so uh, I will confirm that this is lazy because it's not a, it's not an actual problem because technically it was working. Right. See? <laughs> I, don't, I don't need email to function on my Automate server. I don't. So I don't care about it. Real GP, uh, I'm glad that you learned something new about Screen Connect, and uh, hopefully it works better for you um, than there the you SQLite go. database. There is the email Darren sending out. Um, Neil, like Mandy said earlier, uh, just take a, I mean, you can swap back and forth almost uh, easily. So if you are worried about having support on your production system, um, I mean, it's understandable. It's a it's an unsupported configuration. So, I mean, if you are worried about it, and you, it's it's working, working, in quotes, um, then I guess it works for you. But if you do want to swap it over, I mean, we have what, eight thousand six sixty five hundred seven thousand agents. How many agents? Uh, we have eight eighty two hundred or so. I, I, something like that. I've done, and we we haven't noticed. We haven't touched our screen connect. The first time we touched our screen connect resources was when we started giving it out to all clients because of COVID nineteen. And the only thing we did is we added two cores to their VM. Um, that's it. I mean, we we haven't. People complained about it going slow even before they they filtered to the first hundred, I think, or first thousand results or something like that. We never really had any performance issues. Um, if our Screen Connect server restarts, our agents generally start checking back in within the first 10 minutes or so. Um, although, obviously, the longer it's been offline, the longer it takes for them to start coming back. All right, who typed that extra S on there while I was typing? 
Uh, no one. You. Darren. Call of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't find the audit entry. There is nothing uh, called hilarious. failed login. It's it was failed logins. I wasn't gonna say anything uh, because I wasn't sure if which part you were saying was right, and I didn't want to contradict you. So ah, uh, good good cover. Um, <laughs> all right, why is it still not returning anything? Probably because you have to is it lock out an account. Lock an account. Uh, no, it, it should have uh, returned at least a result. Just making sure that each little subquery works. Uh, Gavin Stone, the the real OG, Gavin Stone. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic offer. Um, do we still have our automate agents that are in Adigy still in automate, or do we do we run dual systems with Adigy, or do we? Yes, we have we have two Screen Connect for for people who have Adigy. We have Screen Connect from Adigy, which is an extremely old version. And we have our own screen connect from LabTech. We do them both at the same time. Because you can never have too many ways for someone to get into your system, right? Um, while we're talking control, can you have multiple servers for check-in? Example, outside world people and then clients inside IAAS to save... I don't... I don't think so. Fun. Yeah, I don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you'd need multiple control servers. I mean... I'm not sure what, what the question is exactly. I, I think it's yeah, multiple servers for check-in, as in you have multiple uh, different users to access the same data, different servers. So they access server one, like give our clients access to our Screen Connect session itself and not through Automate. If I'm understanding that correctly, I could be. He's Australian, so I, the language isn't translated. <laughs> I need a translator. Uh, yeah, I'm not understanding that question either. Yeah, can you can, you, can, you, can we translator. retype the question? One control server, but two FQDNs. No. Yeah, no. Yeah. So, if you the way Screen Connect works, the way Control works is that the service is passed parameters to connect to. And it doesn't have provisions to have like a string of multiple hosts to check against. Um, the actual Screen Connect service parameters include like your host name, your session good, and the authentication token and what type of session it is. So it's very um, static, I guess. I don't know what the word is, but you you can't have like a failover or something. It's actually one of the more annoying parts that we have because, like, our production lab tech, under the templates, we specify the host name and we also specify IP addresses. So even if DNS starts failing, it's always online in lab tech. And then we have a problem where um, Screen Connect, you can't have that um, that failover type thing. So if there's a DNS issue, we can't remote into it. Uh, but we do have lab tech to be able to run commands and find out what's going on. So that's how we get around that issue. Um, but yeah, you don't have the ability to do backup host names on it's screen. Removed. You could lab VNC in. <laughs> lab VNC in. Um, if it's not removed, you should remove it. Let's just start with that. Very true. I mean, I'm not against that statement. Um, can you you can still right click RDP, right? I haven't. I mean, obviously, I haven't used. Yeah, the, tool the redirectors still work. The Since. redirectors do work. <laughs> oh, there you go. Look at that. We have two audit entries. Well, we I ran it manually once. When you have the, you know, the word spread co spelled correctly, then it, it seems to uh, work. Yeah. So basically, right, well, that, yeah. Good stuff. We have some changes Sorry, to make to the monitor so that we can count for older versions. Oh, but Michael, Michael decided to join us. Just, I was just reading what Jason was writing. Jason, the way I interpret that is that you want to be able to give external users a different URL to access your Screen Connect server rather than the internal one. Is that correct? Uh, we'll wait for him to respond. Yeah. It takes an Australian, See, huh? I, I've told you, we need a translator. And he's on, <laughs> he's, he's on here, and he's reading, processing, and Americanizing. <laughs> yes, he said yes, Michael. OK. That, that so, should we do. So that's an yes. interesting question. Um, there, is, there is alternate there is alternate URLs you can configure in Screen Connect. Oh, there you go. Answer is yes. Okay, so we lied to you. 
Well, no, we answered there a different question. Oh, <laughs> true. It's very true. To access the Screen Connect portal, to, in order to get access to the to the, the sessions, you can have a secondary or alternate host name. But for the agent to check back to the server, you can't have two host names for like primary failover. Does that make sense? I guess so, because everyone's it not does. quiet. Sorry, I was reading. Right. Um, Sean asked, how do we ensure certificate validation when using static IPs? Um, so the agent doesn't care about certificate validation. No. It doesn't. Um, we also have both HTTPS and HTTP open. So just for fun. Our uh, HTTP redirects to HTTPS for the web interface. Sorry, Darren. And then uh, if the agent fails on HTTPS, it tries on HTTP. So even if there was a certificate issue or uh, like a SSL negotiation problem because of the TLS version mismatch or whatever, um, it would still check back in over HTTP. OK, so I, I like uh, giving the right answers in addition to just the answers. Uh, so there's an it's an agent template setting that specifies your address. And so like Minnie was mentioning, you can have multiple addresses in here, right? So that's how you can have fail back to something else. Uh, and then here's where you can select what the SSL policy is. So if these are all unchecked, uh, then it is going to enforce that the name matches or that it's not expired or that it's a trusted certificate authority. Uh, so that is a more secure configuration. In that vein, it's just normal SSL processing rules. Uh, so if I try to go to a website, HTTPS colon, and then an IP address that doesn't match the certificate name, I get an error. The only way for that to work is that the certificate has to include that IP address as one of its names. Um, so yeah, if you're going to try to use HTTPS with an IP, then you have to give up on the name validation. Um, so security is what you want to make it, basically. <laughs> uh, and so now the monitor is ran. It should have worked correctly. I did a lockout for Darren White. Uh, or for Darren at MSP Geek. And let's see if the audit entry shows up. There you go. There's the audit entry saying that it was locked out. Um, the email would have also fired. And because that was the first lockout, it is not going to be returned in the results here as one of the accounts that has had too many failed lockouts. Uh, so it would not be generating a ticket at this point, but it would have already fired off that email saying that contact number eight has been locked out once. So Darren, can you explain the difference between the status tab and then the build and view query tab? Because it, I mean, the status tab, and I, well, the way I, I understand it and the way I think most people understand it is the status tab is essentially the current status of what the monitor is returning. But it's clearly not true because the monitor shouldn't be showing anyone until after the fourth lockout, which it isn't as you look at query results, right? So um, the, the this is where the duplicate alert frequency comes into play. So if I have a a monitor I'm trying to think of a um so there was a while ago that i made a monitor that would watch the automate release version yeah. uh, so like this number here this version string here all that the monitor would do basically is return that string uh so if we go actually yeah go into a monitor and just hit build and view so imagine that this was just returning uh for the id field that version number. If the frequency was set for once per five years, and then that version number changes, if I hit build and view, I'm going to see a different version number, right? But under the status, it's going to show every failure for the last five years. Every entry in the database alerts is going to show up here in the status. 
So when a monitor, quote unquote, heals, uh, then things will go away from here. If it's one of the monitors that is configured as send fail after success. Uh, otherwise, it's that alert is going to stick in there, even if it's not currently alerting, until this interval expires. So because it's once is per that day. Done, so that way it knows that it's already alerted, and therefore it won't try again? Until that's how until that's how the duplicate detection works. Exactly. Whatever your identity field is, uh, it keeps the first 100 characters of that, and any time it gets an alert in here, if the ID field matches up to something that it's already seen, uh, right. then it's so you. You're really so, abusing the monitor table also because you're abusing the duplicate frequency in order to track how many times it's happened before you actually fail the monitor. Uh, well, that's, yeah. It's, it's double abuse. It's <laughs> If this was a child, they'd take it away from you. Yeah, yeah, very much. The, this, this monitor is something I would not suggest anyone try to uh, <laughs> try to go, oh, well, I can do this. Uh, th there's a lot of delicate relationships involved with this. So um, happy, happy to share the result, but uh, careful. Once, once it's <laughs> once it's Darren's done, Darren, Darren released. Um, so, uh, I mean, unless there's any other questions or additional information you guys want to pry out of us, um, I guess we could call it. I'll give it a few minutes to let everyone catch up and type and all that good fantastic stuff uh that they may want to do um but uh, tomorrow's friday which is great um the meaning of life is 42 according to uh, always 42 if you want another uh, ask it uh we have we have an australian on the phone who can uh you can script, can we script it. the meaning Just, of life it's log 42 uh script note uh, or right host. Right host, fine. Echo. Echo. Uh, print line. <laughs> uh, echoes print PHP or you know, Python, depending on... You can always go really back and do wscript.echo. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know the basic command to print line. It's probably just print space data. Um so, what are you doing to check the end user's machine via control for bugs since everyone is working from home? If you define bug as like a virus or anything, uh, then we're not. Then we're not, no. Uh, we have uh, AV and anti malware, depending on if they subscribe to it, uh, to um, on their work machines. Um, <laughs> as Darren is fiddling around yet again. Uh, it's funny, it's gonna be, he's going to want the rest of his code off of this machine. He's got to copy it and get, get it off of it. Uh, but we don't, we don't check uh, machines for viruses. Um, yeah, it's the machines. home, home. it's the personal computer. We don't have anything on it. It's up to the person's individual responsibility to make sure it's safe. If a customer is concerned about it, um, we make sure the customer is providing work computers to do the work from, where they'd like laptops to take home. And in those situations, those work computers would be under our contract and would include our antivirus and Huntress and Third Wall and every other security package we put on that they want to enlist into. Yeah, so basically you pay for it, you get it. Um, right. They're not covered machines. Uh, and if they want to be covered machines, that's fine. We'll just up your contract. Um, but uh, uh, so if you... Uh, so if there's any other questions, uh, CopyCon LPT1. I don't know what that... Jason, if from, you... But... If, oh, man. Kyle. CopyCon, uh, CopyCon, CopyCon L LPT1 uh, copies the console to the printer. Yeah. Oh, does um, it? Oh, oh, okay. I got you now. I'm, I'm like in something completely different mindset. Jason, is that a script you'd be willing to share out? I mean, I, I we ourselves in Intelli Company use it, but I'm sure others probably would. You made my brain hurt with that, Wesley and Z from New Zealand. I just call him Wes. From, from New Zealand. 
wonder if he's a Flight of the Concords fan. <clears throat> All right, cool. So, guys, anyone who's paying attention or not paying attention, Jason basically asked first um, if we have any kind of process to check for the end users' home machines that they're using to remote into their work computer um, and, like, check them for bugs or viruses or uh, whatnot. And the answer we had was no, we don't because we don't really care about their home machines and it's the, comp it's the client's responsibility to enforce whether or not they care. Um, what Jason responded was he actually made a script for control that downloads and runs a check and returns it as an email. Um, it's slow, but it works, and he will be cleaning that script up and posting it uh, so be on the lookout for that when he does that, because that sounds kind of cool. Um, I have a lot of knowledge of the world. I, don't, I mean, I thought he was from New Zealand. Evidently, he's not, which is fine and understandable. But I, I think the uh, the insults are a little far, Michael. All right. I think that's about wrap up. We've been here for an hour and a half. Uh, we have been recording for about an hour and 26 minutes. Um, they, we have been live for an hour and 50 minutes, but that doesn't count. Oh. The awesome jam session I had up earlier. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> so uh, what I was doing in the background, just uh, doing some more lockouts, configure, you know, verifying that it worked. Uh, here under the history, we do see that uh, my contact did fail. I uh, finally was locked out enough times. And so th this Anything that we see under the history uh, is where the alert actually fired. At this point, it would have created a ticket or done whatever it was configured. Um, and we can see that that happened because of uh, these lockouts all getting recorded, finally caused enough for it to fire like this. Uh, so everything worked, worked the way it should. Cool. All right. That's awesome. Well, uh, all right, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm going to let Kyle finish up because he always wraps up. Wicka wicka. Uh, I'm, I'm, I need to go to bed. Uh, I've been awake too long. <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah, no, uh, it's been great. Uh, if you have any questions or still around, uh, hit us up. Um, uh, we'll let you know when we have full releases of everything we've talked about. Feel free to build your own. I mean, it's complicated, but not impossible to, to manually recreate. Um, the plugin might be. That's. I don't. If you got if whoever if you want the script you don't want to wait for the plugin let me know I I'll send it to you but you can't laugh at it because it was really dirty coding um, that he stole from that me. Michael's Michael's gonna clean up a lot um, but it does require the script that I have does require on premise only the plugin Michael creates will be hosted and on prem um, um, if you need it faster then I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and let me say this but it sh could theoretically work on cloud servers unless my i mean you need cloud servers you need the so. script function to execute uh shell uh, automate server execute or whatever it's called shell execute on the server side um and i'm fairly certain they took that function out wow. of the scripting engine for the hosted systems but darren could tell me for sure if i'm right or wrong it is officially disabled the the built-in function for server execute is disabled. Uh, okay, could, there you could, go. Could, could, is that a permanent disable to having the script run? Uh, because I've got like six ideas in my brain right now of how to make it still run. None of those ideas we're going to talk about live right no, now. No, obviously Come on. <laughs> Kyle, how do ConnectWise still talk to you? Um... <laughs> And Michael comes back. <laughs> they talk to me just like they talk to anyone else. But I'm just curious. Look, if they want to fix all the fl all the uh, potential issues that may let's, or may not be present, let's, let's, let's they can do the that. Let's end the call right now. <laughs> Thank all you right. for watching. It's been great having everybody. And let me know if you want anything.